My name is Janine Deannabal, and I'm a psychologist uh, who has been working in the area of trauma for about the last 22 years. You know, we use the word trauma often. We talk about it a lot. And for years, we used to think that psychological trauma, something happened to us that was bad, that was traumatic. And then we had a psychological response to that event. We had, we experienced issues, we had problems, we had difficulty in relationships, we had trouble in school, we had trouble with our mood because we had a psychological issue. Well, today we are gonna do something radical, which is change the paradigm. And you can see, based on that guy up there coming out of the egg, this is a paradigm shift. And here's the shift, is that psychological trauma is actually a neurophysiological state that stems from a neurobiological injury. There's no psychological component, at least not to begin with. It comes from injury to certain parts of the brain. So why is this a radical paradigm shift? Because if we start treating trauma purely as psychology, then we're only gonna be part way effective in our ability to heal the impact. Does that make sense? You with me on that? So now that we know better, you know, Maya Angelou said, and I, one of my favorite quotes of her, right? You're nodding your head, you know the quote. Now that we know better, we have to do better. Well, now that we know that this is this neurobiological impact, so what? The so what is now we know how to treat it better. We talk a lot about resiliency and how people and young people and adults can be resilient after such a trauma, but what, what does that mean and how do you get there? And there are, because you can't just go to bed and wake up and go to bed and maybe watch some Netflix and you know, get on Facebook, right? And then wake up and feel like we're resilient and our brain is coming back from the ravages of traumatic stress. Doesn't work that way. So we have to be conscious and intentional in our way of healing that trauma. And I'm gonna give you a highlight of what that is. But first, all of these things we can see as traumatic events physical assault, abuse, stalking, bullying, school violence. Dr. Hare just talked about poverty, the impact of living in poverty. And I'll extrapolate that to how about issues of chronic and systematic oppression, okay? Issues around living with racism, homophobia, class differences, differences in ability, where someone is marginalized, ostracized, based on that experience. That is trauma to the brain. That is chronic feelings of a lack of safety or a threat to self or someone's identity, someone's sense of being, right? And, and that result, so all of these things are serious threats. They go beyond normal stress levels. Many of us have normal stress right, that we can kind of deal with. If our coping skills are decent, we can, we can deal with bad traffic or stress at work or making our budget each month, right? But these things have a more profound impact down to our neurobiology. And if you just look at this picture, does anybody know where this picture came from? <coughs> yes, sir. This was taken September 11th. 2001, and I don't know if it was taken when the planes hit the towers or as the towers fell. But look for a minute if you can see, for those of you in the back, I know it's kind of far, but look at the affective expression on these people's faces as they saw that and witnessed that event. How would you describe what they were feeling? Shock, horror, horror 
What else? Fear. I would even go and say terror. Okay? Think about that. Shock, horror, and terror. Now, notice none of you all said um, upset, you know, worried. <laughs> right? Shock, horror, and terror are really the hallmarks of a traumatic experience from an emotional level. And the thing about it is when we see people and we're working with people, we're working with youth or adults who have experienced any of these things, they may not come to us and we may not see them looking like this. Matter of fact, they can look very much opposite of this. Sometimes maybe flat, numb, right? A little checked out. But what's important for us to remember is if we took that neuroimaging of the brain, like Dr. Hare said, we put uh, positron emission topography scans or functional MRI scans, we would see something totally different going on in these people's brains than we would under normal, normal circumstances. So again, my question to you is, so what? Okay, we know this has impact. It's bad impact. So what do we do? Well, this is a slide section of the brain that gives us an idea of this part of the low area of the brain called the limbic system. It kind of sits down here, just above the spinal cord, cerebellum. And this structure right here in particular is a very important structure when it comes to traumatic stress, and it's called the amygdala. It's called the fear center of the brain. I, I like to refer to it as the smoke alarm to the brain. It's always looking for danger, right? Especially if it's been exposed to danger, like abuse, bullying, racism. That part of the brain is always going to be on high alert, like, who are you? Are you safe? Is this situation safe? Right? And this part of the brain is so powerful, and that fear center can take over. What happens is it can kind of knock some of these other areas of the brain offline, so they're less functional, they're less engaged, they're, they're less robust. We talked about it a little earlier, this prefrontal cortex that's about reason, problem solving, focus. It may not be as, as robust. This middle part of the brain is called the insula cortex. Has to do with things like self-reflection, self-awareness, empathy for others, right? Impulse control. Not, not as functional when this amygdala is going nuts. Right? So think, of, think about yourself. Think about yourself when you're scared or something catches you off guard. You know, you may not be the best in your interaction with others in that particular moment. But times that by a thousand at a chronic level of stress. So our goal, our goal in treating trauma then has to be to one, calm down this part of the brain. And simultaneously, beefing up by increasing the neuronal volume, the neuron mass volume in this prefrontal cortex and this insula cortex to offset this. Okay? You with me? Now, what happens, what happens if you don't do that? What, what happens if you don't do that? Okay, bad stuff happens. Okay? So we develop what I call adaptations to the trauma, which is we start doing things that try to calm down the amygdala. Well, what are, we, what are some of those things that try to calm down the amygdala? Take a look at this list. Substance abuse, alcohol drugs, indiscriminate sexual behavior, so acting out sexually in whatever way, self-harm, and suicidal gestures, dissociation, you know what I mean by dissociation? Kind of checking out, numbing. Continued contact with somebody who is hurting us or abusing us or is not good for us but wanting to stay in contact with that person or people. <laughs> Avoidance or withdrawal, engaging in eating disorders, binging, purging, restricting food, 
And then finally, engaging in high-risk behaviors like criminal activity, right? Getting involved with selling drugs or driving really crazy on the interstate or really high-risk adrenaline-producing behaviors. Now, here's the thing. How many of you either have worked with people, kids, you, have, you yourself have engaged in any of these at any time? Right. They're very, very common. But what happens is we start to focus on these as this is what's wrong with people. These are all the issues, the psychological issues that people have. Well, we are, that asks the wrong questions because this is what's wrong with people. But what we have to ask is what happened to people? What happened that someone started using drugs when they were 12, right? What happened that a kid is acting out in school and getting in fights all the time? That's true trauma-informed practice, right? And the next level is that all of these things work on a temporary basis to calm down this part of the brain. They all work, okay? Substance abuse, smoke a little marijuana, self-harm, cut. They all work to temporarily rebalance the brain, get other parts working that aren't working, and calm down some of that fear. But the problem is all of these have long-term and serious con consequences, right, if that is the coping that's used to calm the amygdala and wake up other parts of the brain. So our challenge, our challenge is to find what helps the brain heal in other ways. How do we heal that amygdala and how do we engage the other parts of the brain and beef up and, and uh, promote that neuroplasticity, that expansion of neuronal volume in the other brains? Well, my workshop will dig into these, but there has to be a, an element of all of these things, both from a physical, spiritual, psychological, and emotional level. And it is these four things that foster resiliency. But again, you just don't wake up and do it. There has to be intention to bring these things into our lives. And with more time, I can share with you the science behind, for example, laughing, the science behind positive relationships or connection with things greater than ourselves, whatever we call it, connection to spirit, connection to the universe, connection to nature, right? It has neurophysiological benefit. And this is the paradigm shift. Not that talk therapy is no good. Talk, I'm a traditionally trained classic psychologist, okay? I'm trained in all the evidence-based practices of CBT, DBT, and EMDR. I love them, okay? <laughs> and we should do them but not without supplement of holistic treatments like meditation, mindfulness, yoga, right? Healthy, cultivating healthy relationships. There's where our resiliency is going to be born. So with that, I'll leave you there. Coming attractions for the workshop. Okay, thank you.